Welcome back. Chapter 18 relates the famous Battle of the Sheep. It is similar to the adventure of the windmills, but instead of Dante, the allusion is to the ancient epic hero Ajax. According to one version of his tragic end, this fierce Greek warrior went mad and committed suicide after killing a herd of sheep that he mistook for his rivals. But before giving us Don Quixote as a parody of Ajax, Cervantes reports a brief debate between master and squire about what happened at the inn. Don Quixote is convinced that those who blanketed Sancho were ghosts and otherworldly people. Sancho disagrees and believes things are bound to get worse and that it would be better to return home and attend to the harvest and their households. Don Quixote reiterates his militant attitude. What pleasure can equal that of winning a battle and that of triumphing over one's enemies? Sancho notes that so far experience has not provided him with such pleasures and that even in his battle against the Basque, the knight came away missing half an ear. This debate is cut short when our heroes see coming their way a large and thick cloud of dust raised by two large herds of sheep and goats. Don Quixote declares that they are two armies of various and countless nations, and he informs Sancho that they must aid and assist the feeble and the less favored. Don Quixote, perhaps like us, tends to root for underdogs. Don Quixote's description of the various warriors is an hilarious parody of the chivalric style. We have Emperor Ali Fanfaron, Pentapolin of the sleeveless arm, and Mico Colembo, a raunchy name. Then come Laurcalco, Lord of the Silver Bridge, and Branda Barbaran, Lord of the Three Arabias. Of course, Sancho is only worried about finding a place to hide his ass. And the real problem, as always, concerns the identity of Don Quixote, with whom or against whom is he going to fight. On the one hand, he invents a romantic story. Ale Fanfaron is in love with Pentapolin's daughter, who is a very beauteous and also graceful lady, which sounds suspiciously like the fantasies of our crazy Hidalgo. However, Ale Fanfaron is a raging pagan and is unwilling to renounce the law of his false prophet, Muhammad. Again, Cervantes challenges our view of Don Quixote. Is he a militant defender of the Christian faith, or is he a kind of star-crossed transcultural lover? Nor should we be surprised to find that everything hinges on the geography of Spain. On one side, we have Turks, Arabs, and Africans. On the other side, we have Gothic bloodlines associated with the European ancestry of the heroes of the Reconquista men who drink from the crystal streams of the rivers of Spain, the Betis, the Tagus, the Genil, the Pisuerga, and the Guadiana. Sancho has doubts. Perhaps this is all sorcery, like last night's phantoms. But Don Quixote is resolved. I alone am enough to bring victory to the party to whom I grant my assistance. In the end, the confrontation between Don Quixote and the squadron of sheep is more like one between a maddened Ajax and a young David in his fight against Goliath. Don Quixote attacks the sheep. He set about lancing them with great courage and swagger as if he were truly charging at his mortal enemies. And so the shepherds and farmers unfurled their slings and began to greet his ears with stones. Don Quixote ends up losing three or four teeth and molars from his mouth. However, against all empirical evidence, he insists that a wizard has turned those enemy squadrons into herds of sheep. He even tells Sancho, mount your ass and follow them slyly, and you will see how, once they have moved a bit away from here, they will turn back into their original beings. But before Sancho can do that, Don Quixote asks his squire to see how many teeth he is missing. The result is another hilarious, grotesque scene. This is because Don Quixote took a swig of his balm during the battle. Thus, at the moment that Sancho leaned in to examine his mouth, he hurled upward as if discharging a shotgun, everything in his stomach, and blew all of it right into the face and beard of the compassionate squire. At first, Sancho believes this to be blood. Mother of God, what has happened? No doubt this poor sinner is mortally wounded, for he vomits blood from his mouth. But upon closer examination, he realized from the color, the taste, and the smell that it was not blood, 
but the bomb from the flask which he had seen him drink. And he was so taken by disgust that his stomach turned and he vomited all of his guts all over his master. And the two of them were like a pair of pearls. This is surely the locus classicus, the first case in the history of Western literature in which two characters actually vomit on each other. I have to admit this part kills me every time I read it, but my mother would not approve. After all this, Sancho learns that the saddlebags of his ass are missing. And with this, the narrator makes the first mention of the controversial issue of the squire's salary. He made up his mind to leave his master and return to his land, even if this meant forfeiting his wages and all hopes of governing the promised island. While Sancho remains leaning over his ass and with his hand on his cheek, Don Quixote launches into another of his moralizing speeches. Know ye, Sancho, that one man is not worth more than another. Ironically, at the end of a rather violent episode, for Don Quixote thinks that the seven animals he killed were his enemies, our hero explicitly refers to Matthew chapter 5, verse 45. God makes his sun shine on the good and the evil, and his rain fall on the unjust and the just. Sancho observes sardonically that Don Quixote should have been a preacher and not a knight, which should remind us of the passage from Matthew chapter 5, verse 44, cited by Cervantes' mysterious friend in the prologue, Diligite inimicos vestros, that is, love your enemies. Don Quixote, indefatigable, observes that knights errant there were in centuries past who would stop to give a sermon or make a speech in the middle of a field of battle, as if they were graduates of the University of Paris. There is a certain moral here on the paradox of religious militancy. Let's review. In these four chapters, we have gone from Rocinantes' parody of his master's sexuality to anticipations of the frantic burlesque of the Pink Panther and the infamous vomit scene from Family Guy. All of this is accompanied by moralizing mockeries of the extremes of Spanish imperialism and the excessively anti-bourgeois mentality of certain nobles around 1600. The scholar Harold Bloom once claimed that Shakespeare invented the human. With all due respect, Shakespeare was a genius, no doubt, but he comes nowhere near the human ingenuity of Cervantes.